All right, good morning once again. Uh, so this course will begin with chapter two. Chapter one, we looked at uh, the sharing Jesus, the necessity and urgency. Why do we need to share Jesus? Why can't I do what I want to do? All right. So we looked at chapter one uh, because we know that everyone needs the gospel. The gospel is the power of God under salvation. And we need the gospel. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you, uh, whether you are from any, any other faith, we need the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. And that is the urgency and the necessity of the gospel. Right? So we'll move into chapter 2. What is this gospel that we are talking about? What is the gospel? Is it, is it something man-made? Is it something that we are something that we have come up with paul writes it in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 through 3 if you have your bibles with you first corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 3 can any one of us please read that first corinthians 15 1 to 3 go ahead anyone please read now brothers and sisters I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Yeah. So for, here, is there some more? Go ahead. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures right so let me give you a backdrop of what's happening right uh, now in the church in corinth the church in corinth was a church that was going through a lot of confusion there was division there was a problem in the way that people were taking communion there but it was a church that was already flowing in the gifts of the spirit right but in this church, because of this confusion and things that are happening, people were not settled in their spirit to understand who they are. And so Paul is reminding them, he's saying, now brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preach to you. Right? The gospel that I preach to you, which you have received and which you have taken a stand. And then he goes on, verse 2. By this gospel, you are saved. By the gospel that we preached, you are saved and you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Now the question is, what is this gospel that Paul preached? Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17 through 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 17 through 24. To 24. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Yeah, so now we, last chapter, we looked at the, uh, the importance, the necessity of sharing the gospel. Now, what is this gospel? The gospel is the power of the cross. The gospel is message, the message of the cross. Right? It says here, what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that is the gospel that you and I share. What did Jesus do? He died on the cross for us. He took all our sickness, all our shame, all our sins that he took on the cross. He died on the cross for us. But on the third day, he resurrected again. And right now, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And when we believe in this message, just three sentences, 
When we believe in this message, we are saved. That is the message. You know, sometimes as believers, we try to get very technical about the gospel. Right? We try to say, you know, you have to do one, two, three, five, ten things. Then Jesus will listen to you. Not really. The message of the cross is more than enough to bring salvation to a person's life. It's more than enough. Right? So let me give you this example. Many years ago, I had a very good friend. Um, he was from another faith. He was a Muslim. And uh, we would always talk about you know, the gospel. And uh, he was a very strong Muslim. And I was a very, I wanted to make sure that he knows that Christian is correct. He wanted to make sure to tell me his faith is correct. But we were very close friends. We would always fight, but we would always talk about the gospel, something about God. And so, you know, we would always talk, and he had a biryani shop. Now, the problem was, I had to, if I go meet him, I have to go to the biryani shop. If I go to the biryani shop, I have to buy something and eat. So for six months, almost every day, I had to have biryani. It's not a good thing. It's, right. But the reason I went was because I know that I can get an opportunity to speak to this boy. And we would speak. So it was about three, four months. I used to come up with all kinds of things. Nothing happened. So one day, I remember. I was praying. The Lord ministered to me. Right? Uh, so I also bought a Quran. I started to read the Quran, try to understand where is he coming from? What is he learning? What is he understanding? And one of the verses in the Quran said, you know, Surah Al Imran 215, it says that God was in the bush when God spoke to Moses. And so I just thought of that. God was in the bush. So I met him the next day and I said, can God become man? He said, no. But can God appear in any place apart from who he is? He said, he said no. And I said, your, your Quran says Allah was in the bush. He said, where does it say? So we sh I showed him. And then he said, his mind changed. That moment, his mind changed. And I, then all I did was, I said, listen, Jesus is the Son of God who came into this world. He died on the cross for you. He took up your sins. And now when we believe in him, we have everlasting life. I had food in my mouth when I was talking to him. But at that moment, he believed the gospel. The next day, that evening, that same evening, he gave his life to Christ. After giving his life to Christ, he, you don't have to clap. He gave his life to Christ and he went back home. His father is, works in the, in the mosque. He works in the mosque, right? His father. He told his father, his father said, you cannot, you cannot do this. You will, you know, it's not right. And so he had to run away from home. I bought him a train ticket, one way ticket to Delhi. Right now, he's a pastor of the church in Delhi with about 400 people in his church. How? A message of the cross. That's all. So here, it says that Paul is writing and he's saying, when I came to you, I didn't come with any words of great intellectualism. I came with a message. The message of the cross. What does he say here? First Corinthians 1, 17 through 24. Let's just go over it. He says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So Paul is saying, you know, the apostle Paul had great wisdom. Right? He was studied under Gamaliel. He knew everything under the law. And here, he's, he, when he encounters Jesus, everything he taught and he learned about the law, he was able to point it to Jesus. So he had this great revelation of who Jesus is. And he's saying, I, I came to you not to baptize, but to preach the 
gospel, lest the cross of Christ be emptied. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. What a powerful verse. God has chosen the, chosen the foolish method of preaching the gospel to bring people to Christ. That's it. All we have to do is to believe in the gospel and to preach it. That's all we have to do. Right? It says here, it is foolishness to those who are perishing. Many a times, I tell you, I've shared the gospel with people. They said, this is the most foolish message I've ever heard. Does it make sense? Think of it naturally. Does the gospel make sense? Okay, yes or no? Yes or no? No to the? Okay, are you even here or you are not here? Does the gospel make sense? Yes or no? To the mind, if you think of it, does it make sense? It makes sense? Some of you are very religious. To the mind, it doesn't make sense. How can it be a man who was born in Jerusalem, lived up there, died on the cross, 2,000 years later, we are saying if you believe in him, you, you, you have salvation. Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. It's foolish to those who are perishing. But to those who believe, it's the power of God to salvation. Amen? You know, I was reading this book. And this book is about a person. Uh, it, it, this happened in the early 2000s in, in the United States of America. There was a prison called Angola Prison, right, uh, and towards New Mexico. And this prison was the worst most dangerous prison in the world. It had criminals, people who were there on death row, and it was the most dangerous prison. Many police officers who looked after that prison were killed. So nobody wanted to go to that prison and look after that place. This is the early 1990s. And there was this man who was a believer, right, a police officer. He said, I will go to look after that prison. His, his wife and his family said, no, don't do that mistake. It's the worst prison in the world. But he decided to go. And when he went, he changed things around. He started you know, sticking Bible verses everywhere. He started putting Bibles in each and every uh, you know, prison cell. And over time, he, he, as he was working there, people, the, you know, these are all thugs. These are people who don't care. Right? They are there for, for death row. But what happened was they were using, they were tearing those Bible pages and using it as cigarette paper. They were tearing it and using it as toilet paper. And his heart was really, you know, feeling very bad about it. He said, God, do something. And at one time, there was a man in one of the prison cells. He tore a paper page from the Bible, and he was rolling cigarette paper. And as he was rolling, he began to read something on that. It said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That moment, he fell at his feet, and he gave his life to Christ. One person. Next, he went and started sharing the gospel with others in the prison. Every Sunday, there were about 400 people in the prison having a Sunday service. And later on, in two years, Angola prison became the safest prison in the world. How? Because of the gospel. The gospel, the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But it's the power of God to salvation. Amen? So when we're learning about this subject, evangelism, this is our foundation. 
our foundation how many of you have felt this way you know you're sharing the gospel and you're thinking why am i saying this it's not making sense will he believe will he not believe what if he's going to hit me right what if something is going to happen it's happened to me right but this is when this is your foundation the message of the cross is the power of god to salvation that is your foundation nothing can shake you amen right and and so when you look in the natural you look at a building right if you want to build a 10 floor building what are you going to do the foundation if it's 20 floors you go deeper the higher the building is, the deeper your foundation. You can't have a foundation with 10 feet and say, I'm going to build 20 floors. You can build, but it's going to fall off. But when your foundation is strong on this, the message of the cross, then you're building on strong foundation. Nobody can shake it. Right? Somebody asked Billy Graham in a plane, do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a fish? Billy Graham looked and said, I will also believe if the Bible says Jonah swallowed the fish. Because the Bible said it. That should be our identity. That should be our conviction in the word of God. Right? We preach the same message to the Jews, those who expect the supernatural, and to the Greeks who are intellectual. The same message. The message does not change. You know, many times I've been able to speak to people of very high authority, you know, a big businessmen, people who are in government. By God's grace, I've got these opportunities to share the gospel with them. But the message will not change. Now, when I was in the city of Mangalore for some time, they're looking after the church there. This is very, very rich minister of god not not minister of god a minister government minister and he said can you come and pray in my house now the moment i i went to his house and i didn't know where his house ends because the house is just going and all around the house there are all these sports cars and all of this and they're just lying there and i went into his house and he was very sad very bitter about something and he said you know what my son just committed suicide i'm ready to give all of this wealth if i can get my son back what will you tell a person who has all the money everything that he needs but he's saying i lost my son to suicide so now he's he was asking me what do i do it's very difficult Right? And I remember just sharing the same gospel. I said, I know it's hard, it's difficult, it's not easy, but here's what Jesus did on the cross for you. What did he do? He took our infirmities, he took our pain, he took our sorrows, our weaknesses, and he hung on that cross. He died for your sins and my sins. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And when he rose again from the dead, he destroyed every principality, every power of darkness. That's what he did. Colossians 2, it says that he, he made a public spectacle of the enemy. Remember India won the World Cup? Cricket World Cup? What did they do? They went home and slept? What did they do? What? Celebrate. How did they celebrate? Party. Remember they did the procession? Remember they hired one bus and all of them were like, you know, holding the trophy. Everyone was screaming, oh, that's called a procession, victory procession. You know what Jesus did on the cross? He made a, you know, a public spectacle of the enemy. He triumphed over the cross. He's telling the enemy, listen. Your, your sting was death. Now death has been overcome. I have defeated death. That's what Jesus did. When I shared this simple gospel, he said, can you pray for me that I accept 
Jesus as my personal Savior. Right there, we prayed, and he accepted Jesus as his personal Savior. Was the pain there? Yes. Is he still missing his son? Yes. But now, the grieving has changed. There is hope. There was hope for him. Right? So, the message, whether to the Jews, whether to the Gentiles, meaning whether it is people who believe, whether people who don't believe, the message remains the same. The message of the cross. Now, even as we minister, we look later on on different methods of ministering the gospel. But the, the main message does not change. It needs to be constant. Right? So, for example, we have the supernatural hour or worship times. What is worship? You, know, you just learned about all of that. If worship is about the instruments, then we have failed. The main point of it is that we are worshiping God. And God's presence fills our lives. That's the point of worship. When we are preaching the gospel, we are preaching the cross, the Holy Spirit will do the rest of the work. The Holy Spirit will minister to each of our hearts. Right? Now, let's read Romans 1 and verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Everyone with me? Go ahead. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Yeah. Again, Paul is writing here. He's saying, I am not ashamed of this gospel. How many of us are ashamed of the gospel? How many of us were ashamed of the gospel? I was. But Paul is saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. You know, it's, I've said this before many times. It's easy to preach and teach in a church setting. Now, before I was here, I was working in, a, in the corporate sector as a young boy. As soon as I became a believer, I wanted to just work for some time. So I was working in the corporate sector. Now, it's okay to say hallelujah, praise the Lord with all the praise the Lord people. But what about outside? It's not easy. So I was working in the corporate sector and there, I remember I wanted to live a holy life. But it's very difficult. Because people, people used to come with a water bottle and say, here, Jesus, change, change this into wine. They used to do that. They used to call me Jesus boy. And, and all of this ridicule, all of this was there. And it was very hard. And it, sometimes we feel embarrassed. We feel ashamed. And sometimes, hey, don't go near Paul. He may, uh, you know, he may start praying for you. They'll say that. If I take my lunch and I'll go sit in the cafeteria, they'll get up and go. All of that was there. Now, I'm 20 years old. I used to think, why should I do all of this? Why should I go through all of this? I can enjoy with everyone else. So there was a phase when I was thinking, God, I, why is this, all of this happening? It's the same Paul. It's just that I believe in Jesus. That's it. But I remember God saying this to me, this verse coming very strongly to me. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And I began to speak it in my heart. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Every day I used to speak it. I used to look into the mirror and say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Let people make fun. It's okay. And eventually what happened was in the corporate, in, in the office that I worked in, we used to reach at... The office starts at 6 a.m., work starts at 6 a.m., but we used to reach at about 5.30 because the cabs would leave us there by 5.30. So he said, what to do for half an hour? Everyone will be watching each other. You can't eat early in the morning. So we would just be sitting around there. So God gave me an idea. Why don't you start 15 minutes prayer? 5.30 to 5.45. Then you go and start working. So now how to start 15 minutes prayer? So I carried my guitar. I'll go and sit in the lawn. Start playing guitar. 
I was so embarrassed. Everyone are making fun. So the cabs will stop there. I chose a place where everyone can see me. Who's that guy playing guitar? So I used to sing Hosanna and all of that. Two songs. I used to preach to myself. Because nobody is there, no. I'll preach, okay, with the Bible, I would stand and I would preach to myself for five minutes, pray and go to work. So one day, one guy, he got on and he came, he came straight to me and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying. Can I join you? He said, sit down. So then one day he preached, one day I preached. This went on for many, many, many months. By the time it was, I think, seven months, we had about 170 odd people. We didn't have a place. So we had to hire a hall. Then eventually we found a, we got somebody, we trained them, we made them a pastor. And now that's like a church that meets during the week. Started off with one person. Now we have the choice. We can either be ashamed or we can stand for the gospel. So the reason I'm sharing this is so some of you may go back to your workplaces. Don't be ashamed. You can do something. Don't wait for God to call you to, you know, you have to become a pastor. You have to become an evangelist. God should come down from heaven and tell you, okay, you become, do ministry. No need all of that. Just take a step of faith. Believe that God can do it because that's the power of God. God is able to do it. All he needs is people who are willing. Amen? Right? So the Greek word here for salvation is sozo. And this Greek word is found in the New Testament more than 110 times. And it was a very common word, sozo. It said sozo. It's a, it's a comprehensive word. It doesn't, so sozo, salvation, no. Sozo had a whole group of words aligned to it. What is it? The word sozo means spiritual salvation, forgiveness of sins, healing of, from sicknesses, deliverance from every work of the enemy, rescue or preservation from danger, and harm and total wholeness. So when we receive salvation, we receive all of this. We receive forgiveness of sins. Now I may ask you, how do you know your sins are forgiven? How do we know? How do we know our sins are forgiven? You know, I don't normally share this, but I'm going to share this. When I was 17, 17 years old, 16, yeah, around 17. See, I grew up in a good family. Parents are good, believe, good Christians. I didn't like God. So who's going to follow God and all of that? It's boring. So I got into drugs. And then by 17, 18, I was shooting heroin. Uh, I was shooting cocaine. I was shooting heroin. I was high on drugs. The doctors would say, you know, you're going to die if you, in within a year if you follow this. I said, it's okay. No need to live. Didn't feel like living. But the moment that the gospel entered my spirit, somebody shared the gospel with me. I truly understood what the gospel is. That moment, I was delivered from this. That moment, I knew my sins are forgiven. Nothing changed physically, but I knew in my spirit, I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm no longer in bondage. That moment, I knew that my sins are forgiven. I knew that the work of the enemy had been destroyed in my life. Right? So when we talk about sozo, it means to be saved, to be healed, to be delivered, to be victorious, to be rescued. It means all of these things in one. How many of you, you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and then, um, you know, after receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, 
you you received him and then you feel the same nothing has changed has right as it, as it happened it does happen right you do a simple prayer but everything is the same the same friends the same thinking everything is the same there's no physical proof of salvation but here's the thing when we believe we are saved we know that in the spiritual our body our spirit the holy spirit joins in our spirit second corinthians 5:17 therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation all of the old things have passed away and all things become new so this word sozo means we are saved we are healed we're delivered we are victorious in christ i always share this example each and every person living each and every person in our hearts we have a god shaped vacuum in our hearts meaning there is nothing in this world no friend no family no things of the flesh all the things that we see around can fill up that place of emptiness only god can fill it amen and that's a that's a, that's the place of god nothing else can fill that place no father mother nobody can fill that place it is god only who can fill that place how many of you have you have heard of andre agassi who was a tennis player you have heard of him Andrea Gassi. Okay. okay, he was a Wimbledon champion, right? Let me tell you this. He writes his biography. When he was six years old, he started playing tennis. Right now, tennis is not an easy game, but he started playing tennis. And his vision in life was one day, I want to win the Wimbledon. Wimbledon is the highest form of, you know, uh, of victory in a certain sport. So tennis, Wimbledon was the highest. It's like winning a World Cup. So every year he went through intense training from six years old. He never went to birthday parties. He never went to camps, nothing. All he would do, go to school, play tennis, go to school, play tennis. Tennis was his life. Why? Because all he wanted was that Wimbledon trophy. When he was 21 years old, he won the Wimbledon. He won the trophy that he worked for from the time he was six years old. He came home, he put that trophy on the showcase and he writes and he says, I felt empty. I felt empty. Meaning what? All his life he was working for that trophy, but when he saw it, it meant nothing. That's where he began his search for God. God, sozo means saved from saved out of the devil's power and restored into wholeness of God's order and well-being saved from the power of the enemy I love these scriptures where we can declare the enemy comes to kill steal and destroy but we he has come to give us life and life in abundance greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world you know, this was, I remember we were at Varanasi. This was in, uh, I think it was 2011. We were at Varanasi. And I was not married, so I was doing all kinds of crazy things. We went there for a, a, for a missions trip. And then we were there, and after, the, you know, we were teaching the youth at that time, and so one of the days we went to, you know, the river there, uh, the river Ganges. And how many of you have been to Varanasi? You know, the river Ganges. None of you have been to Varanasi? Really? Where are you all from? You all are from South India, North India? Mix of both. You went to Varanasi. Okay. Who else? Well, it took you so long to understand. 
Okay, anyways. So, so others, nobody has been in Varanasi? Okay. Okay, so it is, it's a, it's a very, it's a place, if you, you can go to, you know, Google or YouTube and see that place, right? It's, there's a lot of, lot of demonic attacks, demonic things that happen there at the river Ganges. I remember one day, so we went there as a team and I was sitting at the river and something told me, go and speak to this man. And this man was once this very scary man, right? He was so scary. I said, God, no ways I'm going to speak to him. Right? Uh, because I don't know what will happen to me. And somewhere the stirring was too deep. He said, go speak. So what I did was I called my parents. I said, if I don't come back home, I'm in Varanasi in one of the jails or something's happened to me. So I called up my, my parents. I said that to them because I, I knew I'm going to do it. And that verse came into my spirit. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So I went to this man, said, excuse me. He was meditating. I said, excuse me. And to my good luck, he spoke good English, very fluent English. So I began to speak to him. I said, I just want to talk to you. And, you know, he was, you know, smoking and doing all those things. I want to talk to you about, what do you want to talk about? He said, I want to talk to you about God. My heart inside is pumping. I thought I'm going to, you know, he's going to beat me up there and uh, something's going to happen to me. But every time I, I, I got scared, the worst came. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Every time I kept saying that. You know, he's talking, but in my mind, I said, greater is he that is in me. If God is not there in me, gone for me. This is my last day. So I kept saying, great as he. And as, as I was speaking to him, the Holy Spirit revealed that he studied in a Christian school. So he knew everything about Jesus and all of that. But he, at a very young age, lost his parents. And he was very bitter about God. So I asked him, at a young age, did you lose your parents? He was shocked. So how do you know this? Because I just felt that. And you studied in a Catholic, you studied in a, he studied in a Catholic school. So I said, you studied in a Christian school and you, you know about Jesus. Can I share about Jesus? He said, no, I don't want to know about Jesus. I said, Jesus wants you to, he wants you. He has his heart on you. He has his eyes on you. And then, you know, he was getting upset, but then I was also getting scared. And I kept sharing. And then he said, okay, tell me what. Now, since he gave me permission, the, the gospel is the... What? Power of? Unto what? Unto what? Unto, for those who believe the gospel is the power of God unto? I want the word. Salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto? Salvation. So I thought about it. I said, okay, God, I'm going to do it. You do your work. So I began to share the gospel. And this is what Jesus did for you. Simple gospel. Two minutes. He said, you pray for me. I prayed for him. Right there. And he said, come, let's go from here. He took out from his bag a shirt and a pant. He wore it. We went out of there. And he said, I'm going to give my life to Christ, but I cannot stay here. So we exchanged phone numbers. He had a phone number. So we exchanged phone numbers. And now... He's in Odessa, pastoring a church. Right? Pastoring a church. The gospel is the power of God. It, we don't need to do anything more. All we need to do is preach, share the gospel. The foundation is strong. Everything else will work. Amen? So we see here, sozo means salvation. Sozo means healing. Sozo means deliverance from demonic powers. Sozo means rescue and preservation from danger. Sozo is for everyone. Tall, short, fat, thin, rich, poor, everyone. Let's read Matthew 18, 11. Let's read that.
Matthew chapter 18 and verse 11. For, for the Son of Man has came to save that which was lost. Yeah. For the Son of Man came to save that which was lost. It's for everyone. Here's the important point. Sozo, that is salvation, is received by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is the grace of God. And we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we say, God, I know I have faith that you have given me salvation. Let's read that Matthew chapter 9, 21 and 22. Powerful. Matthew 9, 21 and 22. For she said to herself, if only I may touch this garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well for the tower. Yeah. Uh, this is the incident of the woman with the issue of bleeding. You know, Jewish customs was that if a woman was had the issue of bleeding, you cannot come into the society, number one, and whatever you touch becomes unclean. Now, this woman got to know that Jesus is passing by. She had a choice. Number one, sit and go through the pain. Or two, get up and go and touch the hem of his garment. And this was probably her last choice because Jesus was a busy man. It was not like Jesus was passing there every day. She knew that I may not see him again. And here, what does she do? She gets up. She goes through the crowds, pressing through the crowd with her sickness, knowing what could happen to her. And she touches the hem of his garment. This is so wonderful. The woman didn't say, only if Jesus can lay his hands on me and pray, I'll be well. No, if I can only touch the hem. Of his garment. She received her healing by grace through faith. And that is what you and I can do. We receive from God by grace, by putting our faith in him. So how do we present the gospel while we are preaching, while we are teaching, right? We must cover these important areas while presenting the gospel. Uh, I'm on page 11. The existence of God and the aspects of his nature. You, you, you begin to talk about God, who God is. He's the Jehovah Jireh. He's the Jehovah Rapha. He's El Shaddai, who he is, his attributes, his aspects, his nature. Then you talk about the problem of sin and its consequences. Now, later on, we'll talk about how to minister the gospel to a Muslim, to a Hindu. But sin is, is a constant. Every religion has sin. So the, when you talk about sin and its consequences, you're touching an area where people will understand. Whether they are from any, any faith, they, will, you know, they, they can understand what you're talking about. Three, you talk about our need for a savior. Sin has to be dealt with. We can try to deal with sins in many different ways. We can you know, sweep the whole room here and take the dust and put it under the carpet. Is the room clean? Outside it looks clean, but there's still dirt. It still needs to be dealt with. So our need for a savior. And what did God do for us? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, as our savior, our healer, our deliverer, our miracle worker. And then people will ask you, why Jesus? Why not any other way? Right? Uh, why not any other person? Then you talk about the uniqueness of Jesus. Why is Jesus unique? What is so unique about him? You talk about that, right? Uh, so you can bring in aspects like his, you know, he was born. Even history proves that Jesus was born. Right? History proves that Jesus was crucified on the cross. Forget about him being the Messiah. It proves that Jesus died on the cross. History proves that on the third day, he rose again. History proves that he, 150 and more people saw him alive. History proves it. Right? There are many secular historians who've written about Jesus. 
history proves it. Right? So you can bring out the uniqueness of Jesus. Then you talk about God's promise as and his invitation. God has promised to bring to to bring bring healing, or God has promised to rescue you, God has promised to deliver you. So you bring in those aspects and you ask the person to repent and believe. Repent of their sins is very important. Right? So you, you invite them to uh, repent and believe. And then you respond, you, res you respond for them, and then the ministry of the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I know it's just points there. You may say, you know, Pastor, it's easy for you to say, but it's not easy to do. But let me tell you something. It is, it is possible. Why? Because we're not depending on our own strength. The Holy Spirit will do the work. He wants us to reach out. And the Holy Spirit will do the remaining work. All we need to do is step out in faith. Right? So while we present the gospel, we learn again uh, as in our coming uh, chapters how to present the gospel uh, effectively, how to overcome our fears and all of that. Right? So... I think we'll stop here. We'll get into gospel in five minutes uh, from the next class. So we'll stop here. Uh, any questions? How many of you have uh, shared the gospel and brought somebody to Christ? I'm sure there'll be so many of you. One, two, okay. Those online? Good. So here's, the, here's what I want to encourage you. I think now you're going out on outreaches, right? Are you going out on outreaches? Yeah. yeah. So I know there may be some kind of fear. Sometimes you may feel, hey, I've never done this. We all have sailed in the same boat, right? The first time I shared, I felt like a fool, right? And I was so scared and I was so nervous. And I didn't do it for many months after that. But God has called us. This is the commission. He wants us to do this. So take a step of faith. Start off small. Right? One of the things that I personally did was I practiced with my friends. When I was in Bible college, I was sitting here with, as a Bible college student. So I would call my, one of the Bible college students. I will say, sit down. Now I'll tell him, you behave like you're an unbeliever. And I will present the gospel to you. But you be harsh. You don't accept it. So I will practice with him. In the break times. And he will get fed up of me. So then I have to choose somebody else. But what happens is you, you practice it. And then nobody wanted to be with me. So I used to practice in front of the mirror. Do both. The people call me mad. It's okay. But the point is when you practice, try to practice. And then you step out in faith. Take that first step. And then I'm sure God, even as we go through this entire course, we'll try and do some role plays towards the end. And uh, hopefully we can get better in this. And the point is that when we finish this course, at least, we should have at least had this sense of, hey, God has called me to minister the gospel, to reach out. And that urge should be there. When that urge is there, the Holy Spirit will then push you to do it. Amen? All right. So let me just close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for this day. We thank you for this session, Lord. Lord, even as we have learned about the gospel, which is the power of God under salvation, Lord, I pray that, Lord, we will truly understand who you are and what you have done for us. We pray that your anointing will rest upon each one of us, Lord, even as we learn and grow, oh God. Help us to step out, to fulfill the call that you have for us. Lord, you said, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that you will empower us, give us the wisdom, give us the grace, give us the strength and the courage that we need, O oh God. And even as we learn, O oh God, Holy Spirit, I ask that you minister to our hearts. We commit each one of us into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. See you next week.